It's Trinity Sunday, and we are celebrating the Trinity. And one pastor I know uh, said that he was praying for all the pastors that will be trying to talk about the Trinity and praying that they don't say anything heretical. So that is, that's the goal. That's the bar. Let's try not to say anything wrong today. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Paul is ending his letter and he ends it uh, the way that he ends many of his letters with this benediction or this blessing. And he uses a Trinitarian formula in order to do so. He says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, if you were a New Testament Christian or a Jew during the days of Paul and Jesus, it, it would have been, especially if you were Greek speaking, it would have been profound that Paul would start with Jesus in this benediction. Because unlike English, if you're an English speaker and you're making a list, you always save the best for last and you emphasize the very last part of your list and it's supposed to pack a punch. Well, in the Greek, usually if you're making a list and uh, something is more important than the rest of that list, you start with the most important. Or if you're making a list of people that you're thankful for or that you want to honor, you start with the most important rather than ending with the most important. And so for Paul's audience, it would have been really surprising that Paul feels so comfortable starting with uh, this blessing and naming Jesus first. And then Paul also calls him Lord, which uh, the Septuagint, the Old Testament, gets translated into Greek. And when it's translated into Greek, every time the name, of the, the, the name Yahweh appears, they replace it with Lord. And so Lord in the Greek becomes this title for God. And so Paul is, is very explicit, very clear. Jesus is God. And he wants us to experience grace from Jesus because it is really Jesus through whom we are made right, through whom we get access to the Father, through whom we are given the Holy Spirit. It is undeserved. It's unmerited. We haven't done anything to earn it. And so, man, the cross is grace to us. And then he wants us to experience, after we know the grace of Jesus, we are, some commentators and theologians say, enabled then to experience the love of God because of the grace and goodness of Jesus. And after we have that love from the Father, then we can experience fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That word in other translations says communion with the Holy Spirit. And who but God would be able to simultaneously, with every Christian in the world, be able to have communion with us. And then he's also a holy and spiritual being slash person. And so all of this is a, a very Trinitarian statement. But the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't come up until early second century Christianity. The word Trinity, as you know, is not explicitly mentioned in scriptures. Instead, what you have is the church, just like a mathematician, you have theologians who are developing a formula for understanding their observations. So mathematicians do the same thing, right, where they're making observations about the universe, and then they're trying to develop a mathematical formula to express and fit those observations. And so this is what theologians do when it comes to developing the doctrine of the Trinity. How do we talk about God in a way that is 
uh, conforming to the truth of Scripture in a way that uh, submits to the reality of what's been taught here. So if Scripture says that there's one God, how are we to understand this Father and this Son and the Holy Spirit? How are we to understand uh, baptism with this Trinitarian formula where Jesus says that He commands us to baptize in the name of the Father and the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. Uh, early theologians would say that it's even, it's even remarkable or important, significant, that Jesus doesn't say in the names of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Instead, he says the name. You have singular. And then you also have this plurality, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have Genesis early on in which God says, let us make mankind in our own image. And he speaks of himself. Uh, He says, in the image of God, he created them. He makes them in the image of God and this sense of plurality to it. How are we to understand that Jesus is rightfully worshipped That when other people commit sins, not against him, they just commit sins, he says, I forgive you. You're forgiven. Who but God could do that? In Acts chapter 5, when Ananias and Sapphira lie about the property that they've sold, and they said they're giving 100% of the proceeds to the church, Peter, Scripture says, that they've lied to the Holy Spirit. And when Peter confronts them on it, he says, you haven't lied to man, but to God. And the Holy Spirit is called God. And how are we supposed to understand and formulate this? And depending on your personality, here's where things get really boring or really exciting, okay? We're going to talk about one God in three persons. And what that expression means. And then we'll talk about the heresies and and our tendencies to lean towards one or the other. And then we'll finish by talking about what any of this has to do with our lives and our faith today. One God in three persons. God, in this sentence, refers to nature. We tend to think of God as a personal pronoun, a name for our Uh, Lord of the universe, right? But when we use this formula, one God in three persons, God refers to substance or being or nature. So in the Nicene Creed, when it says, true God from true God, light from light, of one being with the Father, this being or nature or substance is what the word God means when we say one God in three persons. So you have God, which is a nature. You could also have humanity, which is a, a, a nature or a substance or a way of talking about something's being. Uh, in, in the same way, you could have squirrel, right? And that squirrel has a certain nature or substance to it that's different from man's nature or substance that's different from God's nature or substance. What is the nature of God. The nature of God is to be uncreated. The nature of God is to be eternal. The nature of God is to be spiritual, of spirit. The nature of God is uh, to not be material or physical. It is to be uncircumscribed. That means unbound, unlimited, Unlike the nature of man, my humanity starts and ends here. Your humanity, as you look to your neighbor in the pew, you can see where they start and where they end. The nature of God is to be simple, theologians would say. God is not composed of parts. Unlike man, who has fingers and toes, and you can cut a piece of me off, and you can't do that with God. He's not composed of parts. He's not complex in that sense, but he's simple. He's one. That is the nature of God. So you have uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when you recognize that this is their nature, 
that each of them are uncreated, that each of them are unbound, that they are each eternal. One of the ways that you describe this is that they mutually indwell one another. And so there is truly one divine nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit mutually indwelling one another. Have I lost you? So I, see a couple, I see a couple no's. Some of you are tracking with me. Um, listen to this message twice. That's my advice to you. You have to learn uh, personhood and nature, and usually you have to hear it more than once. Now we have this idea of personhood. And actually, sociologists and psychologists and philosophers, they use this word personhood, and they've stolen it. They've borrowed it. They've learned it from theologians. It comes from the church wrestling through the doctrine of the Trinity, this concept of personhood. But in sociology and philosophy and all of that, the idea of personhood is, at its simplest form, the ability to say I. The fact that I experience me and you experience you, and we differentiate our experiences from one another. You know your history, your past. I know my history, my past. I experience me through me. You experience you through you. This is personhood. And so Jesus knows who he is apart from the Father, and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and all three of them are present. We say that the Father is, is the primary actor in creation, that the Son is the primary actor in redemption, that the Spirit is the primary actor in sanctification. They all have these, they differentiate themselves from one another. Jesus will talk about uh, going to be with the Father so that he can send the Spirit. They have this ability to say, I, and to know who they are apart from one another. They have personhood. And the Holy Spirit is a person who loves you and who grieves for you when you sin and who comforts you when you're in sorrow. Uh, the Holy Spirit is very much a person. Jesus says, when He, the Holy Spirit, comes, He will guide you in all truth. Personhood. Now you have these heresies. Uh, wrong ways of trying to formulate or express this, what we know to be true of God. And the three primary heresies when it comes to the Trinity is this idea of tritheism, that there are three separate gods, um, just like you might, you might picture a family, uh, a son or, and a mom and a dad, tritheism. Then you also have partialism, and a lot of your metaphors about the Trinity are just partialism. Uh, God is a three-sided triangle, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Different parts make up one God. This is partialism. Uh, this idea that God is like a fire. He is the fire and he's also uh, heat and he's also the light. This understanding of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would be partialism. So you've got tritheism and you've got partialism. And the last one is modalism. That God comes, the best way of knowing this is that God comes in different modes. Uh, and so that the first in the Old Testament, he was the father and then he became the son and then he sends the Holy Spirit. And this is a heresy called modalism. And the, the, other, the other heresy that we use for talking about partialism is trying to imagine that uh, the Trinity is like having a body, a soul, and a spirit being composed of three parts. Well, modalism is this idea that God comes in three different forms. And you'll often hear um, water used as the example for this one. Water can come in the form of a vapor or the form of a liquid or the form of a solid, ice. Um, and this is modalism, this idea that God is just taking on three different modes. So the best way, maybe, for us to understand Trinity, one God in three persons, would be more like saying, imagine three people, tritheism, right? But imagine three people. They have one 
human nature, one humanity. But as you see these three people, you notice that you're allowed to say that there's three humans. And the reason you're allowed to say that there's three humans, even though they have one humanity, is because humanity is bound. It's circumscribed. It has a beginning and an end. You see where one body starts and another body ends and begins. But in God, you have one nature and three persons. So when the church wanted to talk about this, they would talk about a statue. Here is one God, uh, sorry, a statue. Here's one substance, marble, one nature, but no personhood. And then you have a person who is one type of nature, substance, being, and one person, one sense of I. And then you have God, one nature, but three persons. So one of the things that we learn about God is that he's other. In other words, there is nothing like him. And that's one of the reasons we struggle so much to figure out an analogy that won't mislead us, is because God is altogether other. There is nothing that compares to him and nothing like him. And this we see all throughout Scripture. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Moses is basically saying, who are you? And God's best answer is, I am. Because he is altogether other. And so we struggle to wrap our heads around this triune God that we serve. The other thing that we learn about God is that He's perfect. He's complete. Man, when I am alone, I do not flourish. When I am alone, I suffer. When I am alone, I experience loneliness. When I am alone, I have a hard time knowing who I am truly. It's only in community that I fully understand who I am. Not only is God other, but God is altogether perfect, altogether self-complete. He is a community, a divine community, three persons, one being, which means that God never created you because he was lonely, which means that God did not need you in order to have company which means that God perfectly glorifies Himself. The Father glorifying the Son. The Son glorifying the Spirit. The Spirit glorifying the Father. He, did, he perfectly glorifies Himself too. He doesn't need you to do that. And He perfectly loves Himself. And not with a selfish, the Father loving the Father, but the Father loves the Son and the Spirit and so on and so forth in this divine dance of selfless love and yet perfect love. And He doesn't need you. God is other, but God is perfect. And i got to be honest, it really feels really good to be needed. As a... As my family lost our vehicle not too long ago, I found myself practicing this spiritual discipline of asking for help uh, and just recognizing that, you know, I need help, our family needs help, I need to borrow vehicles, so on and so forth. It feels good to be needed, it feels even better when people want you even though they don't need you. It feels even better when people want you even though they cannot benefit from you. So I've had people reaching out to me and blessing me and helping me even though I don't necessarily have anything to offer them in return. God is other, and God is perfect, and God still wants you. He doesn't need you. 
He perfectly loves himself. He, he perfectly provides for himself. He didn't make you because he was lonely. He didn't make you because he needed people to glorify him. He can do all of that perfectly. He made you because he wants you. Not because of what you have to offer to him, but because of what he wants to offer to you. And this we see perfectly in the doctrine of the Trinity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as, as we try to understand you, we see fundamentally that you are other, that you're different, God, that you're transcendent, that you're confusing, and yet, God, so holy and set apart and remarkable beyond our comprehension. And Lord, we also see your perfection through it all. And as we do, we see more and more of what it must mean for you to love us, for you to want us. Not because of what you get out of it, but because of what you want to give us out of it. And so, Lord, as we leave here and as we continue throughout our faith, we pray that you would continue to reveal to us this doctrine of the Trinity, this idea of who you are, because we love you and we want to know you more, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.